Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Felder, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, once again, good to have everyone back in here, and uh, we'll pick right up. We left off in a moment in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and we've got verse 8 on the board. So uh, while you're doing that, well, we'll just remind our television audience once again, we're just an informal Bible study. We uh, hopefully don't attack anyone. I certainly never intend to. All I want to do is just present the truth, and uh, the truth shall make you free. Les Feldick doesn't have to have a thing to do with that. So uh, we trust that as you study with us, you'll just simply be aware of what the Word says and not what I or anyone else may say, because the Word is uh, quite explicit. And when you learn how to compare Scripture with Scripture, it's, uh, it's not all that difficult. Now again, we always like to remind new listeners that all the past programs from Genesis 1-1 all the way up to where we are in Thessalonians, there are now 42 of them are available on videotape and uh, audio tape as well as the printed page. So if you're interested in any of that, you just give us a call or drop us a note and we'll get the information to you. Also, if you would be interested in getting our quarterly newsletter, get your name into our computer. And remember that our computer is safe from everything else. Kim even put a note in our newsletter. That's one reason we have not hooked up to the internet with our office equipment because uh, we want no possibility of anybody getting into our ministry computers. So you're perfectly uh, safe in having your name in our mailing list. No one else will ever see it. Okay, I think that's all my announcements, except to thank my television audience for your interest and your letters. My, how we enjoy your mail and uh, your prayers and, of course, your, your gifts, which make it all possible. All right, back to 2 Thessalonians, if you will, chapter 2. And now we'll pick up with verse 8. Remembering in the last half hour, we saw that the Holy Spirit, the restrainer dwelling in the believer, is that force on the planet to maintain a semblance of sanity. And as we see the wickedness and the iniquity constantly encroaching upon us, it just tells us that the cup of iniquity is nearing the full mark. But before it reaches full, that other number of people is the body of Christ is also reaching the full mark and will be, we trust, taken out before the wrath of God begins. All right, now then in verse 8, we well, almost have to read verse 7, for the mystery or the secret things of iniquity. And I pointed out that all your false religions at the very core, at the very center of their high priests are what they call mysteries. And that's why we refer to a lot of them as the mystery religions. All right, so the mystery of iniquity doth already work. It's already present in the world, Paul writes. But he who now hinders will hinder until he, the Holy Spirit, be taken out of the way and then. Now maybe I should qualify because again the verse, the question came up at break time. Now you want to realize that when the rapture takes place and the believer is taken up, that in itself does not remove the Holy Spirit from the planet. The Holy Spirit will still be here to enhance the work of the 144,000, the two witnesses, and so forth, because no human being in the age of grace any more than in the tribulation can come to a knowledge of salvation except the Spirit draw him. And so I have to teach it that as the body of Christ goes up in the rapture, the Spirit just sort of falls off, if you want to picture it that way, and will remain on the planet as the omnipresence of God. Now, the verse I like to use to, again, compare all that is back in Genesis 1. Because, see, all of Scripture fits together. And that's why we can learn from the Old Testament as well as from the New. In Genesis chapter 1, 
verse 2. And I think this is almost a parallel of what we'll see during the tribulation. Even though the body of Christ has now been removed, the believing influence is gone, yet we know that God is going to send the two witnesses to Jerusalem. We're going to have the 144,000 young Jewish evangelists, and they too are going to need the power of the Holy Spirit. They can't operate without that. All right, so now in Genesis 1, verse 2, we have a parallel that after God destroyed, evidently, that original beautiful earth in verse 1, verse 2, we find the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep. In other words, it was covered with water. And what's next? The Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. So even after that judgment of what I call the first flood, what person of the Godhead still remained over the planet? Well, the Spirit of God, see? And so never has this planet been without the manifestation of the Holy Spirit. He's always been here. He's everywhere. Now back to Thessalonica. Even today, we speak of the Holy Spirit as indwelling the believer, and that certainly is true. But is that the only place the Spirit is operating, is just in the believer? No. The Holy Spirit is everywhere. The Holy Spirit permeates even the dens of wickedness. Why? Because He's like the air we breathe. He's everywhere. He is the omnipresence of God. See, that's why no one will ever be able to tell God, but I never had a chance. I was never approached by the Spirit of God. Yes, they were. He's everywhere. And the same way here then, as the body of Christ is taken out in what we call the rapture, yes, the role of the indwelling Holy Spirit stops for us because we won't need the Holy Spirit in glory. See? Because we're not going to be walking by faith as we are tonight. Once we get the glory, it's not by faith, but what? Sight. See? We'll be walking by sight because the Lord is in our midst. What a difference. And so don't ever worry about the Holy Spirit leaving the planet and the seven-year period being without. No, the Holy Spirit will be evident even as he is today. All right, now then I think we're ready to go on into verse 8. And what are the first two words? Time words. Time words. And then, and it's a perfect parallel with verse 3, the very same thing, as soon as the body of Christ has departed, then what's the next thing? The man of sin be revealed. All right, now you bring it on down then to verse 8, and it's the same connotation. And then. Well, what's the and then referring to? the removal of the body of Christ, and the dropping back of the Holy Spirit on the planet. So then, and not until then, shall that wicked, and I hope I don't upset anybody, I add the word one, then shall that wicked one, the Antichrist, be revealed. He's suddenly going to make his appearance by, of course, from Daniel chapter 9, signing that seven-year treaty. That's why we won't know who he is. They can speculate all they want. My, I've got books that people have sent me. Some think it's Juan Carlos of Spain. Some thinks it's Prince Charles of England. Some thinks it's Khrushchev or uh, Gorbachev. And some thinks it's some others that I won't name. Well, hey, listen, there's no use speculating. We don't know who he's going to be, but I'm pretty confident he's already in some European government. I'm sure he's there in some, some capacity, learning the ropes, getting ready to make his political moves. But as soon as we're gone, now I think uh, a fellow uh, Bible teacher, I, I'm not going to name him because I'm not sure who referred to him, uh, what he said, but uh, whatever, he used this statement, and I certainly agree, that this period of time between the rapture and the signing of the seven-year treaty in Jerusalem, he calls it that membrane of time. 
Now, those of you who listen to a lot of this, you'll probably know who it was. But whatever. And I like that. Because, see, a membrane, even though it is so fragile, it's what? It's flexible. See, a membrane is flexible. And so I think it's an appropriate term because nobody knows how long we'll be between the rapture and the signing of the seven-year treaty. It could be 48 hours. It could be a year. It could be a couple years. There's nothing to say that it has to be immediate because the t term that Paul uses constantly is, and then. And then, see? Now, you can use it, an analogy right now today. We've still got one more program after this one. And then we can go home. But some of you are going to stop for lunch, see? So the and then for you is probably an hour or two longer than it will be for us, because I want to go home. But whatever, you can, you can stipulate that the and then is a flexible period of time between the rapture and the signing of the seven-year treaty. All right, and then shall that wicked one be revealed. But the next statement leaps seven years, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Now, I told you this is one of the few places that Paul deals with prophecy. All right, now let's see what Paul is agreeing with. Turn with me to Revelation. Revelation, chapter 19. Revelation, chapter 19. Verse 11. And see what totally different language from what Paul uses concerning the rapture. Paul never speaks of Christ coming for the church on a white horse. Paul never speaks of coming for the church with attendant wrath and vexation. But John does, because John is prophecy. John is dealing with the end of the age for the non members of the body of Christ, whether it be Israel or the rest of the Gentile world. But here in Revelation 19, starting in verse 11, we have the second coming of Christ as he will come to the Mount of Olives. Verse 11, I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. Good time to do it. Keep your hand here. Come back with me to 1 Corinthians. And the reason I'm doing this is because I'm getting so much mail lately of people being told that the rapture is a figment of our imagination, that there's no such thing in the Bible, and that after all, the second coming is the only thing that the Bible deals with. Well, I beg to differ, and I'm going to keep differing by comparing Scripture. All right, now look what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, starting at verse 51. Totally different language. Totally. There's no way you can fit these two events together. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 51, Behold, I show you a mystery, a secret, something never before revealed. We shall not all die physically, but we shall all be changed. There's none of that in Revelation, not a word. All right? In a moment, verse 52, in the twinkling or the blink of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we who are alive and remain shall be changed. And the reason is this corruptible must put on corruption, this mortal must put on immortality. All right, the companion portion of Scripture, of course, is 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 
And again, the only reason I'm doing this now is to compare the language that Paul uses for the outcalling of the church, or what we call the rapture, with the language of the second coming. And they don't fit. No wonder people are confused. All right, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, beginning at verse 13. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 13, he said, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them who have died, that you sorrow not, even as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, or if we believe the gospel, even so them who are asleep or who have died in Jesus, God will bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord shall not precede or go ahead of them who have died. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of the archangel, riding upon a white horse. No, that's not in here. And that the, day, uh, that the uh, coming of the Lord will be with wrath and judgment and war? No, that's not in here. All of a sudden, in a normal day, the trumpet will sound, the Lord will descend from heaven. And then verse 16, reading on, And the dead in Christ shall rise first, then we who are alive remain will be caught up, raptured, together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall ever be the Lord. There's none of that language in the second coming. None. Nor is there any second coming language in Paul. And so they are two totally different events. All right, coming back to Revelation 19 then. So here is what leads up to the destruction of this man of sin, the wicked one, the Antichrist that Paul is referring to. All right, that's why I brought you back to Revelation. All right, come on down to verse 16. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords, absolutely, as he returns to the planet and he's going to rule and reign. All right, now then jump over to verse 20. This is what Paul is alluding to in 2 Thessalonians 2. Revelation 19, verse 20. And the beast, the wicked one, the man of sin, the son of perdition, I saw the beast taken, and with him the false prophet, or the great religious leader that's going to work hand in glove with him, these two men, remember, and so they were taken that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them who had received the mark of the beast. Verse 20, reading on to the end, These both were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. All right, now that is what Paul is referring to. Come back to 2 Thessalonians. This is what Paul is referring to then when he says that He's going to destroy with the brightness of his coming. He's going to end his domain on earth. Oh, listen, he's been the God of this world. He has ruled the kingdoms of this world for 6,000 years. Oh, here another verse. I can't help this. Go back to Matthew, 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 chapter... Four, I think it is. Matthew 4. Because so this is all fits together. Matthew 4, drop in at verse 8 and 9. Matthew 4, 8 and 9. Now this raises a question in my own mind. In one portion of Scripture, we know that the demons know the Scripture, don't they? They believe and they tremble. Well, Satan, we know, is the prince of demons. And with all of his brilliance and all of his intelligence, 
he's still kind of dumb. Do you know that? There are some things that evidently he has not yet figured out. Number one, I always go back to when he thought he had the Lord totally defeated when he hung on that cross. I know that Satan thought he'd finally put his chief advocate, uh, ad adversary to death. But evidently Satan did not know that he'd be raised from the dead. All right, now here's another one. Here's another one, Matthew 4. Now this, of course, is before the crucifixion. But verse 8, look at the audacity of this personality that we call Satan or the devil. Again, the devil takes him, that is, the Lord Jesus, again the devil takes him up into an exceeding high mountain and shows him all the kingdoms of this world. Now that means what it says, and it says what it means. What does he show him? He showed him the glory of Babylon. He showed him the glory of Greece, the glory of Rome, the glory of everything that's been since, and all of the marching armies of Hitler, and all of the power of NATO, and all of the political maneuverings of the present day world system. The devil in his cockiness says to the Lord, you see all that? You see everything from back there to way out there? Look at the next verse. All these things I will give you if you'll fall down and worship me. Isn't that amazing? And you know what I always have to ask? Were they his to give? Yes. Yes. He's the God of this world. But, here's where I think he's kind of dumb. He evidently didn't know that one day Christ would have all the kingdoms of this world and he wouldn't have to bow down to Satan to get them. Because he's going to get them by power and force and the wrath of God and Satan is going to come to his just end by going straight to the lake of fire. But isn't it amazing? Isn't it amazing that he had the audacity to offer the Lord himself, the creator of everything, all the kingdoms of this world, if you'll worship me? And they are his tonight. This whole world system is under the control of Satan. Oh, God's got his sovereign, I know that. But Satan is the God of this world. Don't ever forget it when you wonder how can politicians, not just in America, but in any nation, even Israel, God's biblical people, their politics are rotten to the core. They're just as corrupt as any other nation on earth. Why? Because they're still under the control of the God of this world, even Israel, until, of course, the day comes when the Lord will rule as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. All right, now let's get back to Thessalonians, chapter 2, verse 8 again. So then shall that wicked one, the Antichrist, be revealed when he signs that seven-year treaty according to Daniel, chapter 9. But the Lord shall consume him with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy him with the brightness of his what? Coming. So you see, I guess maybe I should put it on board. Haven't used the board all day. Here we got our seven years, and we always divide it in half, don't we? And the first thing that happens is the Antichrist signs a seven-year treaty with the nations of the Middle East. Israel, right off the bat, is going to come back under temple worship. They're going to go back under the law. But at the midpoint, the Antichrist comes, I think, from his headquarters over here in Europe, and he's going to defile the temple. He's going to turn on Israel and bringing in the last three and a half years of the wrath of God. The wrath of God is going to be poured out for these last three and a half years. Oh, it's going to be bad enough in here. Don't ever think that this is going to be real rosy. 
But here's where it really gets tough. And it all leads to his second coming, when he will actually come to the Mount of Olives. And Satan is going to be sent to his uh, abyss at this time. I, I used the wrong one. I'm sorry. I'm going to have to come back and correct that. Come back to the Revelation. Satan is not sent to the lake of fire at the end of the tribulation. He doesn't do that till the end of the kingdom. Uh oh, that was a real booble, wasn't it? Oh, that was a real one. Come back to, uh, oh goodness, at the end of the tribulation. No, oh, I'm sorry. That's that's uh, that's the uh, that's the Antichrist. I'm sorry. In chapter 20, chapter 20, there's where we have the demise of Satan. The Antichrist is the one who, with the false prophet, is, is sent directly to the lake of fire, but not Satan. Uh, I have to cross that. Sorry. But now in chapter 20, at the end of the tribulation, whom God will take off the scene with the power of his coming, verse 2 of Revelation 20. My, I'm glad I caught that. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years, cast him into the bottomless pit, so that, of course, he can bring him back at the end of the thousand years. And now flip over. we got to do this quickly. Still in chapter 20. Now we come over to chapter 10. And this is probably what Paul is really referring to when he will destroy him with the brightness of his coming. Because after all, all of these seven years and the thousand years, I think, are all part and parcel of the day of the Lord. All right, verse 10 of Revelation 20. After the thousand years are completed, verse 10, the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the Antichrist and the false prophet are, and they, all of them, shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. So back to 2 Thessalonians for just a second, and then this half hour is gone. So back to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 8 again, that the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Now, like I said, that can picture all the way from the seven years to the end of the kingdom, but rest assured, God is in control. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Felding. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the Scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, Route 1, Box 760, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552, or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Feldick.